On this channel, I have pushed and pushed and pushed for people to read the Gospels. The first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These four books, written by four different people, each tell the story of Jesus' life, and they each include many of his teachings. In many, if not most cases, the stories and the teachings in those four Gospels are the same, sometimes even word for word. I have encountered strong, even stubborn, resistance to reading those four books, with people insisting that they are but one small part of a bigger book, called the Bible, and they invariably prefer to read and quote other parts of the Bible besides the four Gospels. Many have argued that every word of the Bible is infallibly equal to anything said in the four Gospels. A few have even argued that other books of the New Testament or of the Torah are superior to the four Gospels. The end result of such a teaching is that it takes people away from the life and teachings of Jesus. When I have dared to question whether the Bible itself claims infallibility, it has outraged many people. One very reasonable argument that some people have given to me is this. If the rest of the Bible is fallible, then what about the Gospels? How can we trust them any more than we can trust the rest of the Bible? I want to address this argument in this video, and I'll do so in three ways. I'll discuss the difference between inspiration and infallibility, the difference between something that is said by the teacher and something that's said by the audience, and the difference between the essential truth of a passage and the finer details of the passage. But before I start, I want to look at a verse from the first epistle of Peter. Yes, a verse from the epistles. You see, I also recognize that the epistles are inspired by God. I often quote from them. Anyway, more about that later. Peter wrote this. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. Now bear in mind that the Bible, which is often referred to as the word, did not exist at the time that Peter wrote this instruction to early Christians. Nevertheless, he was calling on those early Christians to seek out this sincere milk, as he called it, whenever and wherever they encountered the voice of God. At that point in history, this voice of God came most notably through the teachings of Jesus, which they had already received right across the board, not in writing, but through word of mouth and through memorization. This sincere milk, as he called it, could be found in many places, but most notably they found it through the Word made flesh, Jesus. And that's what we need to be seeking, even now, the sincere milk, the essence of truth. What is it that God wants to tell you and me right now? That's what we each need to be reaching out for. I hope that you who are listening to me now are hungering and thirsting after that truth. And with that, I'll move to my first point. Inspiration versus infallibility. The word infallible is bandied about by a lot of religious leaders who want you to turn your brains off and let them pour into your head whatever nonsense they may come up with. On the grounds that it all comes from an infallible source, the Bible. It is not your job to question what they are saying as long as they can quote a Bible verse here and there to support what they're saying. Now, the classic illustration of how dangerous this is goes something like this. Someone says, God wants you to hang yourself, and he wants you to do it now. I can prove it by the Bible. And then they proceed to say, the Bible says that Judas hung himself. Jesus said, go thou and do likewise. And he further said, that which you do, do quickly. So off you go, hang yourself, do it now if you want to be saved. Of course, this is a pretty extreme illustration, but it's exactly the kind of stuff that happens all the time, even with some of the most widely accepted doctrines in the churches today. Well, take the infallibility doctrine itself. Paul said to Timothy that all holy writings are inspired by God. 
and that can be helpful in our spiritual walk. Not a word about anyone or anything being infallible, or even about what constitutes a holy writing and what does not. Nevertheless, what Paul said to Timothy, and this again was before the Bible existed, has been rewritten in this way. Every word of the Bible, preferably King James Version, I suppose, is infallible. And every word in the Bible is equal in terms of proving any doctrine you want to prove or to disprove by using it. It's no wonder that so many people, after having accepted that anything quoted from the Bible has to be taken just as it stands, throw their hands in the air in frustration. <sighs> and they give up on ever hoping to personally understand anything in the Bible. The book's way too big. And they know that even if it clearly does not teach some newfangled doctrine, there will be someone telling them that the original Greek or the original Hebrew did, in fact, say things to support their interpretation. Now, some people have assumed that I'm campaigning to rewrite Paul's instruction to Timothy in this way. Every word of the Gospels is infallible and equal in terms of proving any doctrine you want to prove. No, 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 on three counts. Not every word, not infallible, and not equal. The four Gospels are, in my opinion, holy writings. They are inspired. They are incredibly useful for teaching doctrine and instruction in righteousness. Just as Paul said to Timothy, but they are not infallible, and not every word in them is equally reliable. It is irrational to assume that something must be infallible before we can believe it and receive it as being from God. Now imagine this scenario. You're feeling depressed. Everything has gone wrong and you're just about to give up your faith. Then along comes a sister who said that God placed it on her heart to tell you not to give up, that he loves you and that he will be there for you if you just keep trying. But, as it happens, you know that this sister often suffers from depression herself. Is she infallible? No, of course not. But was she, in that instance, inspired by God to give you what you needed? Did God breathe through her to lift your spirit? Did you drink in the sincere milk of what she said? And did you profit spiritually from it? Can you see the difference between someone being inspired and someone being infallible? You don't have to be infallible for God to speak through you. And neither do the Gospels need to be infallible for God to speak through them in the most powerful way that he has ever revealed himself to the human race. In primitive religions, which practice idolatry, people are told that the idols fell out of the sky sent to earth directly from the gods. That's how the leaders get their followers to put their faith in those idols. Now, many religious leaders have done that with the Bible. They have made an infallible, dropped out of the sky idol out of the Bible, instead of what it obviously is. It's a collection of holy writings from a lot of different people over a long period of time. All of them, even including the authors of the four gospels were fallible, human beings. There's not one word in the Bible itself to say otherwise. But still, God has spoken through those people in a way that has proven to be immensely trustworthy ever since. We can pick up this book and recognize great truths in it without having to accept every single word as infallible. This should come as a great relief to people who have felt guilty for questioning a few things in the book itself or for questioning many more things for which this book has been blamed. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are without a doubt inspired. But I do not believe that they are infallible. And I will explain that in a bit. My next thought with regard to the Gospels is a comparison between the teacher and the audience. We have in the four Gospels some of the most accurate evidence of what any man in ancient history ever taught. There are at least three different writers who all agree, in many cases, word for word, on some of the most important teachings of Jesus. This one on your screen now is a classic illustration. 
because the actual quote from Jesus emphasizes that his teachings will never pass away. All three writers agreed to the letter that this is what Jesus said, even though more than 35 years had passed between when he said it and when these men did their writing. So many of those who claim to believe that the whole Bible is infallible dismiss all the teachings of Jesus with a stroke of the pen just by saying we don't need him anymore. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the book of Acts. Or we have a bunch of letters that were written by early followers of Jesus, which they say are better than anything Jesus taught. But I cover that deception in other videos, most notably the Last Reformation and Paul versus Jesus. For now, I want to show you how even when reading the four Gospels, you need to keep your brain in gear. Not everything recorded in the four Gospels is Gospel truth. In fact, this spurious connection I made earlier involved three quotes from the Gospel. Judas went and hung himself, Go thou and do likewise, and that which thou doest do quickly. But it takes more care than just being able to pick up the stupidity and that connection to see through other issues relating specifically to the Gospels. For example, we need to take note that not every word in the Gospels is a quotation from Jesus. Take Mark 6, 3, for example. People in the audience shout out, Is not this the carpenter? Now, from that, people have assumed that Jesus must have had a job before he started working, that he worked as a carpenter. But this is almost certainly not true. In fact, in Matthew's account of the same scene, he says that what the crowd asked was, Is not this the carpenter's son? According to Matthew, there was no hint that Jesus himself was a carpenter, although he probably did know how to make a table or two. But let's allow Jesus himself to speak. Remember, we're contrasting the teacher, Jesus, with the audience, those people in the crowd. At the tender age of 12, Jesus had become separated from his parents as he sat asking questions of the rabbis in the temple in Jerusalem. After two days of searching, his parents were quite upset by the time they found him. But Jesus said to them, Didn't you know that I would be here doing my father's business? Can you see the difference? Jesus, the teacher who was featured in the four Gospels, knew, even at the age of twelve, who his father was, and he knew what his father's business was. It was not carpentry though he may have learned a few things as a result of being raised in a family whose father was a carpenter. So don't trust his enemies to tell you what his profession was, not even when they are quoted in the Gospels. That should pretty much go without saying, but still some people miss it. However, we can't totally trust his friends either. They are not infallible. I have said that elsewhere with regard to the book of Acts and the epistles. Those books reflect the fallibility of the people in them. And many Christians miss that. The same fallibility is there in the Gospels as well. Peter denies Christ. Thomas doubts him. Judas betrays him. Jesus himself expressed frustration at how hard it was to get through to his followers what it really means to be building an invisible kingdom called the kingdom of heaven. To their credit, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record the incident where his disciples tried to cast the devil out of a young boy, and they couldn't. They all record Jesus as saying to the twelve, How long am I going to have to put up with your lack of faith? They just couldn't get it, and some of that persisted, even after the day of Pentecost. They never attained perfection. To this day, I think Jesus must agonize over how blind we can be how easily we are led away from him and back into our religious traditions. Look at this passage from the opening two verses of the fourth chapter of John's Gospel. The Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples did. To this day, the church continues to water baptize people. Why? Well, because the apostles did. We totally ignore what it clearly says in the Gospels about the Holy Spirit being what Jesus baptizes with. Many of Jesus' disciples had been followers of John the Baptist, and it was extremely hard for them to let go of John's way of doing things. Let's stop following the audience, 
and start following the Master himself. In the first chapter of his letter to the Corinthians, Paul suddenly realized this. He saw that water baptism had caused nothing but division in the early church, as it continues to do to this day. And then it struck Paul that it's not about water baptism, it's about preaching the gospel. As we preach the gospel, we do baptize people in the same way that Jesus did. We baptize or cover them with his spirit, his teachings, just as he commanded at the end of Matthew's gospel. So even in the gospels, we need to be careful that it's Jesus whom we are following and not his friends. And now we come to the third aspect of fallibility in the gospels. The essence versus the details. I'm often amazed at the ridiculous efforts people go to in order to convince themselves that there is absolute perfection in all of the details of accounts in the Gospels. If one Gospel says he healed the blind men and another one says he healed three blind men, then they say it must be referring to two different events. Well, if that was the only contradiction we had to deal with, I wouldn't have a problem with it. But really, it goes much farther than that. If one Gospel says that event A happened before event B, and another gospel has the order reversed, then again we have to believe that at least one of those events happened twice in order to defend infallibility in the details. And there are numerous contradictions with regard to the order of events in the four gospels. But the ultimate example of overwhelming contradictions must be the story of the resurrection, which is recorded right at the end of all four gospels. I would challenge anyone to study all four accounts and weave them together into a single narrative that explains all of the contradictions. There are at least a dozen contradictions, some of which are fairly significant. Well, significant with regard to such things as whether he ascended to heaven in Jerusalem or whether it happened in Galilee. But that is where we need to distinguish between the details and the essence. All four Gospels agree that Jesus was crucified, that he was dead for at least a day and a half, and that he eventually rose from the dead. That is the essence of all those passages. Can you see how the details can be far from perfect and yet the essential truth remains? This essential truth is the sincere milk of the Word that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. I do believe that God has miraculously preserve the essence of what Jesus said and did for the salvation of the world. But I also believe it does not require any of us to exercise blind faith in the infallibility of anyone except God himself as revealed through Jesus. I might even go so far as to say that with the teachings of Jesus, some of them are clearly more relevant than others. And so we are required to walk in the light of those teachings of Jesus which we have seen and understood, even if there are others which don't seem to have as much relevance or to be quite as clear for us. Why, for example, did he curse the fig tree? I don't know. Maybe one day I'll see some absolutely immense lesson from that incident in his life. But for now, I just need to walk in the light of what I do understand with regard to the rest of what he said and did. So, in conclusion, I have provided three situations where the Gospels are probably not infallible. At the same time that I have provided three areas where the Gospels are clear enough for us to be extremely accountable if we fail to recognize them as the greatest revelation of God's will for the human race that is available anywhere in the world today. The Gospels are inspired by God. The Master himself is quoted in the Gospels. And the essence of what he taught is there, even if we do not reach full agreement on the details. I do not need to be infallible myself to warn you if a truck is headed toward you at 100 miles an hour. And the same is true of the Gospel writers. They have shown us who is good. And it is your task to walk humbly with God as he is revealed to you through his son Jesus. We have at least three human witnesses Matthew, Mark, and Luke, who agree in great detail with what Jesus said. And the fourth witness, John, majors on telling us who Jesus is. 
If we believe John, we will believe Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not because they are infallible, but because they have been used by the Holy Spirit to reveal the one who is infallible, the only begotten Son of God. What Jesus is reported to have said in those four books is clear enough that we cannot argue against at least trying to live our lives in accordance with his teachings. Leave infallibility for someone else to argue about. The real question is this, what are you doing with the truth that has already been revealed to you through Jesus and his teachings in the four Gospels? Think about it. Amen.